Today's format is that Deborah and her editor, Nicole, will be in discussion about Deborah's latest book, Seventh Novel. And this is the, let's see, can I do that right? Right there. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful cover? And it's one that you can easily remember with all those stripes. It will jump out at you in the bookstore. Um, so they're going to be talking about the author-editor uh, author process and how that evolved this particular book, but also they've worked together on another book as well. So that should be really interesting to a lot of the writers in the audience, but also readers to know how this thing happens, you know, how, how it changes and, and evolves based on the editor input. So then at the end, we'll have a Q&A and Vera Wildauer, who is one of the other co-founders of the Manzanita Writer Series, will be handling that. So when that is announced at the end, you can write your questions in chat at that point, and she will read the questions to Nicole and Deborah to answer. So now to our, our two presenters, and I'm going to have to look off a little bit on this because I have not got this memorized. There's an awful lot of background for each of them. Deborah Reed is the author of seven novels, most recently Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan, and then the prior one, The Days When Birds Come Back, both with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. She's taught novel writing at the Hellenic American University in Athens, Greece, the UCLA Extension Series in Los Angeles, workshops and conferences around the country, and she was previously, for many years, the co-director of the Black Forest Writing Seminars at El Albert Ludwig University in Freiburg, Germany. She now lives on the coast of Oregon and is the owner of Cloud and Leaf Bookstore, a really wonderful independent bookstore here in Manzanita. I'd also like to say that she has taught a 10-week um, novel series twice here in Manzanita, and I can attest to the power of that. We have a, a novel group that continues on and are, are getting close to completion because of her. So if she does that again, I highly recommend it and I'll be signing up right away. Um, now, Nicole Angeloro is an editor at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and she's the manager of Mariner Books HMH's paperback imprint. She edits both fiction and nonfiction and I understand a lot of historical fiction um, and oversees the Best American series. She's a graduate of Brown University with a degree in history and attended the Columbia Publishing course before moving to the Boston area. So, on to Deborah and Nicole. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you so much for that. Um, as Kathy said, I'm an editor at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. I've been there about 15 years, and I do nonfiction and fiction, and I acquire books, uh, so I'm reading submissions, uh, you know, always evaluating pitches, but I'm also doing sort of big picture developmental editing. Uh, I don't move commas around too much. I, uh, I leave that to the copy editors. So what I do with my authors and what I've done with Deborah on the two books that I've been lucky enough to work with her on is talk about character and plot and, you know, could could this be um, could this be a little pacier? Could this happen faster? Would this character really say that? Or I want more information about that. I'm really coming to the material first and foremost as a reader, um, and I really always have my reader hat on and my sort of editor, publishing company representative hat on after that. So that's kind of how I approach working with writers and publishing books. The, um, the more corporate side of things is that I am sort of the liaison between the writer and the rest of the house. So I'm always talking to my colleagues in marketing, publicity, and sales about my writers, about their books. I am being a nuisance. I am being passionate. I'm trying to get more money and get more enthusiasm. Um, on that side of things, I'm also the liaison with the design department when we're talking about um, book covers and with the copy editing department when we're actually like making the book look like a book. So I'm sort of at the crux of a lot of different, um, different processes, creative and otherwise, and am having to be tactful about a lot of different things and a lot of um, sometimes conflicting desires and intentions. But for the most part, we are very lucky to be championing books um, and sending them out into the world and hopefully finding readers for them. So 
it's a creative pursuit, but it also is a selling pursuit. And I think there's a often can be a little bit of attention there. Deborah, as a bookseller, I think also has a sense of this, where there's these these beautiful things that someone has labored over for years and years, but you're also selling them for $15.99 and they're being shipped across the country as a product of like toilet paper on a truck. So yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a funny business and um, it's full of surprises. No day is ever the same. No book is ever the same. No writer is ever the same. Uh, I've been very fortunate in the people I've worked with. Um, as I said, this is my second book with Deborah, and I love kind of, that's the ideal, that you have these kind of relationships with people that you can evolve over time, over books. I love spending time in Deborah's brain, first and <laughs> foremost, but I also love spending time with the places that she writes about and the places that she imagines, and it's especially nice because I, in those two books that we've worked on together, they both take place in the Oregon coast. Um, so I'm so pleased to be joining you all from, from New England. Uh, <laughs> but I feel like I, I have such a, such a sense of, of where you are um, from, from Deborah and her characters. And this particular book um, follows 93-year-old Violet Swan, who became famous for her abstract paintings which evoke tranquility and innocence and joy. Uh, and she writes on the Oregon coast. Uh, the business of Violet, sort of keeping track of her legacy and her art, is run by her only child, Francisco, and his wife, Penny. Um, but as Violet's last days seem to be approaching, an earthquake near their home sets a series of events in motion, and her deeply, deeply hidden past begins to resurface. And then her beloved grandson returns home with a family secret of his own. And Violet is forced to come to terms with the life she left behind many, many years ago, a life her family knows nothing about. So it's a story of secrets. It's a story of family. It's a generational saga that spans, you know, most of 20th century U.S. history. Um, particularly, there's a lot of really interesting stuff about World War II, the World War II era. Um, but it's also a story of a, a woman artist in mid-century America who forged her own way when it was pretty much an old boys club and how a woman creates her own life um, and creates her art and also is a wife and a mother. So there's just, it's a really meaty story. There's a lot to sort of get your teeth into. It's the kind of book that I, I like to work on because it's working on a lot of levels, but it's also as a reader what I'm drawn to. Kathy mentioned I work on a lot of historical fiction, um, and I, a lot of the nonfiction that I do is, is also history. Uh, I was a history major, so I, I spend a lot of time thinking about the past, and particularly how the past and the present intersect, which is why this is the perfect story for me, and I, I love spending time in it. Do you have anything to add, Deborah? I Well, <laughs> I think... Um, I, I think, well, it's clear, it should be clear to everybody um, uh, why it's such a, a joy and a, a pleasure and an honor to work with you. Um, you are such a champion of my work. And um, I, I love what you said about being a reader first, because I really feel that. Um, I, I feel that when you, I hand over my manuscript to you, that you are first and foremost a reader and um, your feedback feels like it's coming from that place. And then we work our way up to the editor um, aspect of it. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I've been very fortunate to have um, this as my, my second book with Nicole. And um, we were joking the other day about, you know, well, we'll tell everybody about the, the fights we've had. And, you know, it, it was just really funny because we, to my knowledge, have never even had a disagreement. Like, I, I feel like Nicole gets the vision that I'm trying to, to put across in the book, like instinctively. And so her feedback works toward that for me. And I, I was jotting down a few things about, um, 
some uh, some of your your feedback and it it really uh, these are just perfect examples of how you approach the work and and me as a writer it, and it, they're just really simple things but they're they're exactly the thing that I need to hear that tells me what I need to do next. Um, I'm a little bit frightened. I don't remember. I, like, I don't know what I, <laughs> it's been well, a while. One of the things we were just talking about is, right. you know, it takes a long time from those first drafts to actually having a book out in yes. the world. Uh, you know, it, it's a process. It's years that, you know, you're living right. the story kind of in, in your own head and space, but then I'm living I'm crawling into that space with you and living there for for a couple of years too. So we're yeah. really in we're in the trenches together for better or for worse. Right. And um, but I also don't totally remember what I said. Right. It's, it's <laughs> don't right worry. Now. It's not, okay. not it's um it, they're they're sort of simple things like, you know, you need we need some more breadcrumbs in the last third mm -hmm. of the novel in order to tie up that ending and then, you know, explaining what you mean by that and you're exactly right like I will have a sense of you know something about this section of the novel doesn't feel right and then you will come back to me and say well it needs more breadcrumbs you know we need to see some more follow through with this plot line maybe in this chapter in this chapter you can add a little bit in and like the minute that you say it I know exactly that that's the right thing and I just dive back in and I I do it so um it's a wonderfully symbiotic relationship that um, that we have. You are the one who recommended um, doing an epilogue with the book because the 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 ending that there was too big of a jump and and it was bothering me. But again, it was like I I wasn't sure how exactly. And you you said, well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna jump in time like that. Um, let's just do it as an epilogue. And then as soon as I thought of it in those terms, it opened up wider for me and I was able to to fill it in so um so yeah I think that that's that sums up the foundation yeah. of our, our I, part of my being a reader first is that I'm sort of the test case right if I'm if I'm having trouble getting to the place where I, I think you want readers to get to I can say wait wait you need to make those connections a little bit more which is what I sort of think about my breadcrumbs is, you know, you're leaving your breadcrumbs in the yes. woods so you can right. <laughs> find the path. I don't, I don't, I trust an awful lot, but I also think you kind of need to, to lead them, to lead them where you want them to go to. And that's, that's a balance. You don't want people scratching their heads at the end. Um, you're yes. not, you're not setting out to be Agatha Christie and right. you know, <laughs> not have people know who done it. Um, right. Yes. Yes. You know, I, I do think there are places of tension where I think, there can be foreshadowing and alluding and you do have some uh spoiler alert there is a crime um that happens and I, you know you do kind of have to set that up it's amazing when you're talking yeah. about you know regular people's lives to some degree how dramatic they really can be i just thought of it there's a there's a crime and um many many crimes actually yeah there yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> anyway, you know, but so so you you can I I do I read a lot of mysteries and I I have worked on some some mysteries and crime fiction in my day and even for stories that don't have that sort of classic twist or you know or classic structure mm -hmm. um, and a lot of fiction that sort of pops up where you you do want to you do want to lay that groundwork and that foundation even if you're not telling a crime story or a murder yeah. mystery. Yeah, and I I do I do appreciate that kind of pacing, um, you know, the pacing of when you decide when to give what information, where, and um, I I tend to do that later in later drafts. I is where I can best see once I have something bigger in front of me, where the best places are to add in, um, um, you know, uh, another cliffhanger or another another plot point that um, feels evenly paced throughout to help turn the page. I am making this sound like a very plotty novel, which I kind of think oh. it is, but it's also, <laughs> it's also very interior and you're, you're yes. a beautiful writer sentence by sentence. And I think- Thank you. Um, I sort of spend less, I, I trust you a lot with, with your word choices and your, 
um, your sense of rhythm and your sense of, of sentence by sentence. You know, that's your, that's your voice. And I, mm -hmm. I, I tend to trust people there. And as I said, I'm no copy editor. So I don't know that I always trust myself. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I, I can talk myself in and out of anything when it comes to grammar or style to some degree. Um, so I, I really want to let you be you there. But when it comes to character and um, believability and, and stuff like that, you know, I, I'm a person of the world. I, I feel more confident yes. about, about that, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Well, you touched on the subject of copy editor and mm -hmm. editor, and I think it would be interesting um, to talk about that for a moment. I, I'll, and I would like to add that I, I was very fortunate on the, both of these books to work with the legendary Larry Cooper. Larry Cooper. He, um, he's a legend. The copy and he, editor of the old school. Yeah, he just retired. Yeah. I don't know if my book was one of my, well, obviously my book must have been one of his it last. It was one of the last, yeah. Um, but he's yeah. worked with Philip Roth and Tim O'Brien and Cynthia Ozick and um, Paul Theroux. Paul Theroux, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I always, you know, I would go from you, which was an amazing experience and I felt like I was on solid ground. And then the book moved to Larry, which was um, just uh, I I loved uh, I mean the experience of working with the two of you together has just been um, I I don't even have the words for how and Larry, much Larry is more confident about <laughs> going in and muddling with a sentence um, than I am certainly and I'm I'm always sort of curious once I'm done with it and it goes off to the copy editor I don't I don't see it again in the same way I don't really spend time with the book. Right. In the, like right. did laid out first pages kind of way again. I always wonder I always wonder what your what was your impression or what were your first feelings when yeah. I sends the manuscript back to you? Well, um, it's always fear. Time. You know, fear is always the initial I fear too when it was Larry. <laughs> yeah. I um but I will say that um Larry was, I think because I do pay such close attention to sentences, I think Larry appreciated that. And we didn't have a whole lot of back and forth be between us in that way. Um, but he would say funny things like, you know, this, this line is a little bit saucy. Did you mean for it to be saucy? Is that what you're going for here? You know, um, and it, just those kinds of clarification of tone and um, uh, mood and, that sort of um, real nuanced take and look at at things and um, but it was always uh, a pleasure to get get his responses I, I felt like um, just by the little things that he would suggest <clears throat> the manuscript just went up a level you know as it did after you or you know how to look at it um, which is just for a writer, the best feeling in the world when you have a team of people who truly care about the work that you're doing and they understand your vision for it and they point out ways that you can take that vision to the next level. And um, I, I know it's one of the most satisfying aspects of, of writing a book. We're always polishing. You know, yes. I think that word gets thrown around a lot, but you're doing, you're doing the heavy, the heavy lifting to a lot of, you know, to, to the base degree. And I'm, you know, fussing around and Larry's fiddling, but, but, you know, we have such respect for, for the work and for the time. Um, being a writer is hard. It's lonely. I think to yes. some degree. you can be, yes. you can be lost in your own, in your old world for a long time. And, and, it's a privilege to be one of the first people to, to really spend time in that world after you've lived with it for so long. Yeah. I'm curious to hear more about your, your sort of your process. What do you, how do you write? Um, do you have routines? Do you have rituals? Was, does it vary book from book? I know this book came together pretty, pretty fast, um, which I, I like to see. Yeah, so, yes. <laughs> well, and I don't even know why, you know, it was just one of those things that um, the characters, I, I, they were so pleasant to spend time with, I mean, even in the darker parts of what I was writing. I just loved writing this book. And um, 
not that it wasn't hard and not that I didn't have plenty of days where I thought, what am I doing? Why did, why did you trust me to write this book? Um, you know, I, <laughs> you know, um, the whole imposter syndrome, um, would flare up, but, um, even, even after six books, even after books. six books, yeah. and I'm sure it will be, it will always be that way. When you're in the middle of it, it's just a dark and desolate <laughs> place where I, I think actually on the a subject of that, I think part of that comes from the fact that because you rely as a writer on your imagination so much, you don't really know the source of that. And so if you don't know the source of something, how do you know that when you go there to get it, it's going to be there? So every day you sit down and you're just, it's an act of faith to try to do it again, to try to roll around in there and, and turn, um, you know, make something out of nothing. And so I think those feelings of, feel, of, of being lost and, um, you know, uh, just no self-confidence in what you're doing, I think, I think it stems from that place. And I think it's normal to feel that way. And I, and I do, I'm very accepting of those feelings at this stage. I'm like, oh, here we go again. That's, I know what that is. I recognize it. I've seen it before. Um, but as far as my process goes, I, um, I, you know, I get up in the morning very early and I sit down, you know, before the sun comes up and have a cup of coffee and I just get to work and I, I feel um, before the day can get in the way and the rest of the world can get in the way, I give all of myself to that work. And um, sometimes in the afternoon after I've had a hard day's work, I will go back and read it as a, try to read it as a reader, the work I've done for the day or the week and um, see, you know, if I'm, how I could edit it a bit and clean it up a little bit. And if I'm hitting the beats the way that I, I want to, um, but I don't do an outline. I know uh, plenty of writers do, um, but I don't really know where I'm going. And um, which is probably evident to you because <laughs> the whiskey still. The whiskey still. So you can tell that story about how I approached you when I was trying to figure out what to when write. When you were, when you were, we were talking about what this book was going to be, and you were excited because you had stumbled across a story. I don't know if I'm going to get the details exactly right, but part of your family lore, you had figured out that your great grandfather, um, great grandfather, had been a run runner or yeah, what, a whiskey what, runner a whiskey during, runner during prohibition yeah. prohibition <laughs> and the still had exploded and tragically um a young child one yeah. young child yeah one yeah, his child, granddaughter his was granddaughter still. was in the house and died and he went to prison yeah and you and so you had found this story and and you said i'm gonna i'm gonna write something about this um and so you went off and then I got the first pages and it was about this like 93 year old abstract painter. <laughs> and I was like, but where's the whiskey still? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I didn't, I just had to be patient because the whiskey still shows up. But um, it was kind of a real, it was a real glimpse into how you could take this one sort of piece of family history and build it out to to incorporate so much more it wasn't just going to be the story of this one family right yeah and I think I've heard you say um when you talk about the book about how you started to think about your your grandmother was also a child in that house yes. and went off to live with um her relative, older sister with her yeah. older sister mm -hmm. and so that would be sort of the same time period when that happens to Violet. And so you're thinking about yeah. your grandmother's life and, and what we don't know about our family history and what we don't know about the people who came before us, what they've kept close to the bone. Exactly. Those family secrets. Um, exactly. And I, and I think that's a good example of how fiction tends to work where it just comes in um, in phases and, and builds on itself because when you're using your imagination to write 300 pages worth of a cohesive manuscript, 
um, you, uh, you, you're relying on things that aren't necessarily tangible and um, it takes time. And this is why novels take so long to write, um, partly is because the writer doesn't always know where they're going. And it's, you, can, you kind of have an instinct, you have a sense of where things are headed. Um, I knew that that whiskey still was at the core of a bigger story. And I did write, I did want to write a story about um, an artist, a woman, um, and the two of them managed somehow in my brain to come together to create <laughs> this, a larger story about a family and an artist. Um, but the whiskey still turned out to be the catalyst for um, changing the trajectory of the main character's life forever. And, and that's where it landed in this novel. That takes place in Prohibition. And then uh, it's not historical fiction. It's, it's contemporary story, but Violet is sort of in this in-between where she's remembering the past is bubbling up to the surface. And it, it's, the present day story is, is very much the, the focus, I would say, but it's also yes. very much in the past with her, the recollection of this really incredible life. Um, how much time did you have to spend researching kind of the 30s and the 40s and the 50s to make that piece come alive um, in a way that would feel part part and parcel you know mm -hmm. it, yeah it, it feels very very much like an old an older woman remember it um well i'm glad you asked that because um i this is the first book i've written where i really had to do that kind of research i um, i really had to capture a whole different time span for her backstory um which is you know takes up a good chunk of this novel once she starts to divulge her um, story to her grandson, Daniel, who is a filmmaker. And he's been asking to make a documentary about her life for a long time because no one knows the story. And so once she finally decides she's going to tell him the story because she's come to the end of her life, um, that includes a good chunk of, of, of um, this novel. And so what I would do is because I didn't want to get mired in in research and stop the actual act of writing is I tend to literally write a sentence and then within parentheses, I will write, um, add research here, add World War II info here, leave it, and then just keep going. And that way I don't go down the rabbit hole of, you know, spending days and days reading about, you know, the, the South and steel mills and during World War II and that sort of thing. Um, but one of the fun things that came out of doing this research is um, going on eBay and finding actual um, materials from that era. So for example, it's like show and tell. I found this, um, one of the things I needed for the plot line was to know what Violet might have been reading specifically in July of 1944 while she's taking a bubble bath. <laughs> in a hotel after you know, trekking across the United States on foot. And, um, and so I found this Vogue, this copy of Vogue on eBay from July of 1944. And lo and behold, I mean, imagine my luck when I see articles by Dorothy Parker. Like what? How lucky can a person get? So I, you will see in the novel that I have Violet in the bathtub reading a piece by Dorothy Parker in the July issue of 1944 of Vogue that she's picked up at a newsstand. So, um, and, the, and the story itself that, I mean, the article that Dorothy Parker writes is about the war and men going to war and coming back, not the same as they were when they went in which, you know, then linked to um, the man that Violet would go on to marry, who was someone who was, went off to war. So that was, that was just such great fun and great luck. And, um, and just like, as, a, as another example, in my, um, 
the book before this, The Days When Birds Come Back, there's a, uh, the house, two houses that are featured are these Sears Roebuck houses. And I did the same thing. I got these books, Mail Order Homes, um, the houses that Sears built <laughs> um, off of um, eBay. And it was, they were filled with everything that I, that I needed that would set me right into that time and, and place. Um, so that was, that was actually a really fun thing that I got to do for research. You, um, you also got the chance to sort of envision what your town would look like 75 years ago because you're, it, it's based on where you live. Um, yes, yes, and, and I and there's a I use a wonderful book um, by a local author Jane Comerford, who some of our viewers I'm sure know personally. Uh, she wrote a book called At the Foot of the Mountain, and it is about the the history of this exact area. And one of the wonderful coincidences that I discovered was that I have my character Violet arriving on this coast in this town in the 1940s, and as it turns out, in the 1940s. Um, there were artists coming here and setting up house and getting other artists to come here as well. So the thing that I just imagined is actually the thing that actually happened. Um, like the, what are the, I think the first curator for the Portland Art Museum moved here and then she made it her mission, mission to get other people, writers, painters, um, uh, musicians to come out to this area to live and create this sort of artistic community, which to this day you can still feel exists here. There is a very artistic community um, uh, essence in, in this town. And um, so that was a, an interesting um, coincidence. Do you, um, do you wanna read us a little, a little snippet? Of the book? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So um, I think I we've think, I think we've sufficiently said it. <laughs> I think we have. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I picked a little um, part of the novel where because um, so much of the novel is about um, Violet's past coming to the foreground to create a whole life, uh, and um, I, so I picked a piece that includes all of the characters. Um, there's Violet, there's her son, Francisco, and his wife, Penny, who live downstairs. There's her grandson, Daniel, and um, there's even Lady Bird, her old dog. So um, this is a moment where you just uh, start to see um, the things that were hidden in Violet uh, come, to the, come to the foreground. And so I, just as a note, I was constantly shifting between this present day Violet in the past Violet and trying to get the two of them to merge throughout the whole book. And this is one of the first times where that really starts to come out. Um, it was one o'clock in the morning when Violet felt a sharp stitch beneath her ribs. She lay awake, checking her breath, staring through the skylight at constellations appearing and disappearing behind wispy strings of clouds. The wind softened. Every so often, bats fluttered near the eaves. Then a movement outside triggered the motion sensor light behind the house and Violet rose from the bed and went to the window where she saw a raccoon scurrying across the backyard into the woods. This was the hour of predators. Violet recalled nights spent in the woods where even the smallest creatures feasted like chiggers on skin. She didn't care to look into the dark, but here a distant streetlight breached the hill and shadowed the trees and yard with a midnight blue and the telephone wire cut a silver streak across the center of the window frame, and it was beautiful to look at. A strange vapor rose from below. Violet knew instantly that it was not the marine layer rolling in from the sea. It billowed upward like smoke. She leaned her head against the glass and spotted Francisco pacing the wooden deck below in his underwear, the small mound of his gut lit by the light of his phone as he smoked a cigarette. Lately, Penny claimed that roast beef and steaks and cheeseburgers would put meat on Violet's bones, and she'd been trying to feed her the way Violet had fed Ladybird toward the end, offering a special reprieve from canned dog food, though Violet understood that Penny didn't intend it that way, and anyway, the meat was working on Francisco's bones instead. It couldn't be over 50 degrees out there, and the soft drizzle would make it feel even colder but it was the red tip of her son's cigarette moving in the dark that Violet found most strange, 
a faint fog rising above his head. Had he spent a lifetime hiding this habit from his mother? Had he just now taken it up? She watched until he stubbed a cigarette out against the lava rock and then cupped the butt in his hand. She guessed he would tuck it in the trash where no one could see. Violet had given up smoking decades ago, and at her age, who knew if the cancer had anything to do um, with what she'd done in her past. She'd gone on to live a very long life in spite of everything, and a grown man smoking outside his own house in the night shouldn't seem such a terrible thing. After all, Richard, that was her husband, had smoked cigars right up until the moment of his death when the one between his fingers dropped onto his chest and burned a tiny hole in his sweater before Daniel had a chance to knock it away. So why was Violet so angry? She crawled back into bed, mad at the world in a way that surprised her. She'd been in love with it for so long, she'd forgotten what it was to come up against it. Maybe this is how it works at the end, like raising a teenager. A rush of ill feeling sets in, making it easier to throw up your hands, step away, and say goodbye when the time comes. The stitch in her side burned brighter. She pulled the blanket over her head to shut out the images behind her eyes, but the memories continued to flare. A doctor's large mouth slowly enunciating words through straight white teeth. I can help you. Violet had glanced up from chewing her nails. I'm afraid of it, and that's saying something. I'm not afraid of much. Flooding the brain with electricity has a way of nurturing the parts that are suffering, he said, leaning back and sighed as if exasperated. It will make you a better mother. Richard's face turned red with rage. She's not. No, Violet said. Let the doctor finish what he has to say. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the first indication that we see that, um, that there's some mental illness that she has struggled with in her, in her past. And um, uh, it's almost like as, as her past rises up um, and the reader learns what's happened with Violet, Violet almost seems equally as surprised at, <laughs> at her own past. She's depressed. <laughs> So much. Yes. Um, yes. But, but I, it, it allowed her to thrive. I think one of the things that I've been so enamored of from the beginning is she kind of single-mindedly created the life that she wanted for herself out of really um, difficult, difficult circumstances. And there's so much hope there. Um, I, I have taken comfort from it. The fact that you can, you can make a, make a life for yourself and make, make the life that you want out of sheer perseverance um, and talent and yes. Um, yeah. She, all of it. she was singularly focused and um, by contrast, her daughter-in-law Penny is like the flip side of that um, where she sort of gave up things that she wanted for herself to play the role of mother and wife and she's dissatisfied with her life and doesn't really understand why and so it's almost like two ends of the spectrum of being a woman and in a family with children um, uh, one of the things i did want to mention um, is is another thing about when i was doing research and the the inspiration for the artwork in this book was agnes martin uh, who's an abstract um, geometric artist, and she, um, her work is known for evoking joy and harmony and happiness in the viewer, which is very unusual for abstract art. It generally is something that people look at and they, they think, well, what does it mean? You know, um, and so I wanted a character who had that sense of offering up these uh, these wonderful feelings in the viewer. And for it to come from a character who's been just gutted by tragedy and trauma. Um, and I found out in the course of, again, coincidentally, in the course of researching Agnes Martin, that she too had a very difficult past. And she too 
um, had to undergo electric shock therapy. It was a strange symmetry between these two women and um, it kind of left me stunned to discover. Another weird thing that I discovered after watching a uh, video, uh, a documentary about Agnes Martin, was that she, um, she actually worked in the shipyards in Portland. I didn't even know that Agnes Martin had spent any time in Oregon. So I broke out in a sweat when I saw that. I could not believe it. I mean, I knew she'd come down from Canada and made her way down and lived in New Mexico and some, some of the time in New York. But um, it really truly was the perfect place for a young woman at that time to get a, a good paying job. And so my painter did it and Agnes Martin did it. And that just is a remarkable thing to me. And they did it independently. Because independently. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So how are we doing on time? We're, we're good. Um, I, did, I, have a, I have a funny question I want to ask you for, as, from yes. the perspective of a bookseller yes, and a writer. Mm -hmm. um, the differences and the, um, the story behind hardcovers and paperback. So one of the reasons I bring it up is because this book came out as an original paperback. Mm -hmm. My last book came out first in hardcover, like so many do. And then a year later, they come out in paperback. So a day doesn't go by in the bookstore where someone doesn't say to me, you just fill in the blank, Does this, is this book out yet in paperback? And when I say no, they say, okay, I'll wait till it comes out in paperback. <laughs> so can you talk about the work of putting out hardcovers and then a year later the paperback and what that all means and how you're shifting now toward original paperbacks from the get-go? Yeah, I would say um, I would, I mean, it's not a recent shift where we've been doing more paperback originals. Um, I think there have been phases where it's something that we felt, you know, more, more keen on, on trying um, for fiction primarily. Um, like, um, like our, our probably most successful paperback original uh, was Jhumpa Lahiri's uh, interpreter of Maui's. Um, yes. So, and also we did um, Friday Black kind of recently. So mm -hmm. often we do it when we want, we really want people to take a chance and pick something up and where there isn't that far to entry, um, where people see the $27 for a hardcover and think, eh. Yes. Um, you know, I'm going to wait for the paperback and then you forget about it. So often, we we feel like Oops. it's just it's stores bookstores are are maybe more likely to also take more copies because the price point is lower for you guys. Um, it's just a way to sort of be a little bit friendlier to both our retail friends but also our consumers, where we're we're sort of saying, you know, we want you to we want you to take a chance on this. Um, and sometimes we do it for debut writers. Sometimes we do it for writers who are maybe trying to introduce to a wider audience. Um, it's just it's just a way to sort of get people to to pay attention mm -hmm. when they might when they might not because it's a bargain. Yes. Yeah. Um, no. And I I feel um, I I feel very lucky and happy at this point that I that I can offer a paperback original because as a bookseller, you know, I just, well, yeah. And we didn't we didn't expect the world to fall apart in this particular way. Exactly. Um, but I feel like in 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 these in these times, you know, having a lower price point is not a bad thing. Um, in terms no, of the sort of more traditional life cycle of a hardcover and then a paperback, um, you know, we do sometimes change the cover uh, either because we don't feel like it totally worked in hardcover mm -hmm. or we want to try to get a different audience. Sometimes we might skew younger with a paperback cover mm -hmm. um, or we might be thinking more about an academic course adoption market with a paperback. Um, you know, we, we like to get, we like to charge more for things too, because yeah. <laughs> we're a business, you know, right, but we, right. so we, so we, so we don't, we don't want to pay, we don't want to do everything in paperback. Um, yeah. and, and certainly for a lot of really news driven books, 
um, you know, like all the political books that seem to be coming out, you know, whether it feels like very of the moment, people yes. are going to pay top dollar for that um, in a true. way that fiction, just, you know, doesn't always have that same immediacy. Um, a lot of books are published every year. So um, particularly with fiction, I think paperback is a really um, comfortable you know appealing place and we were very committed to making our paperbacks look um still look high quality like mm -hmm. I, I think the paperback you know we want them to be beautiful objects too just yes. at, a, at a lower price point yeah and I feel that with my book I'm I'm so pleased with the cover and I've I've heard so many comments about um the cover. Um, oh, that which, should we should we confess that this is yes. the first cover? Yeah, let's let's tell the because let's I tell think our it's... dirty secret. <laughs> well, this was not going to be the cover. <laughs> um, it was going to look a lot different than this. Yeah, my uh, my sales department really likes to put ladies on the covers of novels where there is a lady. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and I, I, I appreciate the instinct there because again, they're trying to, you know, they want to get books in Costco because, you know, a lot of people go to Costco. Right. Um, right. They want, they want your mom's book club to like pick up this book with a lady on it because it feels familiar and it's, it's, you know, it feels like, oh, if you like this other book, you'll like this book, you know, it, yeah. Publishing is funny where you want the, um, you want the, the cool new thing, like the new voice, the, the new concept, the great, the great shiny new thing that everyone's excited about. But you also want to have the familiar titles in the marketplace yeah. <laughs> because you need, you need to have a track. You need to know the shiny new things are hard to predict how they're actually yeah. going to do. So there's that particular tension where like you want things that feel fresh and unexpected and not everyone has. But you also yes. want to have a sense of like how how it's gonna do because as a bookseller, yeah. I think you have a sense of what people will reach bit, for, right? Too. Yeah, yeah what their crapshoot. Yeah, what their eyes go toward the the books mm -hmm. people just tend to gravitate toward, and yeah, you know, and I I as a writer took in you know what everyone was saying, you know, this will this cover with the woman on the front, which did look very familiar, like so many other covers that I've seen, um, will give you a better shot at being you name it, Costco, the airports. That was back in the day when you know when airports. People, so I mean, yeah, who quite yeah. thought, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and um, and so I absorbed all of that because I'm not a marketing specialist. I don't know. I'm not a sales rep. But but as it turned out, like I I really couldn't sleep at night. Like I was literally so stressed out that that was going to be the cover, and I just felt that we it were was having a lot of early morning phone calls in my yes. time. So yes. I don't I don't know what time you were. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes, um, middle of the night. I, I was. It was so stressful for me because it just felt too incongruent for me to go along with. Uh, I just felt like, how do you, how do you write a book about an artist and the, the actual design of the cover does not depict something of art? And it, I just, I, I couldn't bear it. And, um, and as it turned out, the, um, the, this, the, what we ended up with was, was an actual early version um, that the designer had already put together. And so it was already almost ready to go. We just had to finesse yeah, it a little it, we bit. We had looked at it early on and the group had kind of broken. And when we talk about covers, it's a big group. Um, there are a lot of voices because again, we, when we publish something, everyone is behind it. You know, it's a group effort. Um, and the, the group had kind of broken in a, in a more expected direction. And we had sort of left this other version kind of on the table. And when we brought it back to the jacket meeting, you know, saying, oh, you know, the author's having second thoughts, like you wanted to open this discussion up again, the group broke strongly, strongly in this direction. So, um, yeah. you know, I think sometimes even when we live with something for a while, looking at it with fresh eyes can, can be good. And I think having, having someone say, you know what, this isn't working for me can we try again? 
Yeah. And you I, know, I was, it, it, I was it can so, be helpful. yeah, I was so grateful that I was heard. And, and also and it just shows how fickle we all can be. Yeah, exactly. Right? You know, True that, it's, yeah. it's not, it's not, um, it's instinct and it's not an exact science no um, it's, but it's one of the things we did thing. is we also changed the title remember okay. that so it was it was with a woman and it was just violet swan and when we changed the title to pale morning light with violet swan with this cover and put those words on this cover that's when everyone went that's when oh, it yeah. clicked oh yeah we needed, that's great yeah <laughs> we needed the um we needed the title change to go with the with the new the, the two design. things had to happen at once, I think, to, mm -hmm. to make that shift. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, well, and I had oh, talked you out of this title originally because my boss had said it reminded her of like painting with Bob Ross. Have I ever told you that? <laughs> I don't remember. You may have, but that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, uh what but what like, you could do worse than bob ross is yeah, turn, but, <laughs> i know i i don't know she said it like it was a bad thing at the time right. but, but i don't hey, know it's familiar yeah. it's familiar um uh one of the things i did want i had jotted down in my notes that i do want to mention before we end up going to take questions is um that that uh, and i think writers and readers might be uh, curious about that moment when um, I send you, I send off the manuscript to you and I'm waiting to hear what your opinion is, like what happens in that um, abyss <laughs> for, for me. And I, and I dove back into some of my emails. You mean that abyss where I like tell you I'm going to get back to you in like <laughs> oh, three weeks no. and then like five weeks go by and I'm like, um, I'm so, I'm still working on it. No, so. you're actually, you've actually been really pretty on it with me and I've so appreciated that. Um, but I, I did look at the emails and one of the funny things that I read in my email after I mailed it off to you was, okay, now I'm going to go get a massage to see if I can stop my eye from twitching. I remember that. <laughs> and it was like, good luck. It was literally, literally like nonstop twitching. It was, I had reached the, <laughs> the apex of my stress level of trying to get you this book and also I was in the process of purchasing the bookstore. So there was a lot going on Not as I was trying on. to hand this off to you. And, um, but that is, that is pretty accurate in general. That's when I, I sort say. of come in is when, when the eye starts twitching, I say, hand it over, <laughs> take a break. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when my eye starts twitching, I send it back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Or just hand it off to the copy editor. Yes. Let's get this out of here. I don't think um, Larry ever had a twitching eye. So no, Larry was a cool cucumber. Cool man. cucumber. He just mm -hmm. exuded confidence, and that yep. that guy knew what he was doing. So we we will miss him dearly. Um, um, so we're getting close to the hour uh, yeah, point do you here. Have any, oh, Deborah, I was just going to say, do you have any other questions for me? This is your this is your time to put me on the spot. Um, yes. Um, 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 well, we, let's see, we talked about those things. Um, oh yes, I do. Uh, for writers, like, um, in general, when you get, you, when you're pitched something new, um, do you, you know, so many new writers are told this thing about the first five pages and, you know, that's, that's where, you know, everything depends on the first five pages. Is that true? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I usually do read more than five pages. I will say the pitch is pretty important, but that's pretty personal too. That can that can um, not so much like is it the most amazing pitch ever. It's more is this something that I would be interested for in my own list. Um, most editors have kind of various lanes that they're most comfortable in, or that they are. Um, sort of tasked with developing for the house. Um, so some of it is just, is this right for me? Is this right for me right now? That could be based on what else I might be working on or if someone else is working on a book that kind of could overlap in, in ways that someone on the outside couldn't, couldn't have any insight into. Or if I yeah. know that another editor at a different house is working on something that has kind of a similar um, 
similar pitch or, you know, again, there's stuff like that, that, that I would be thinking of even before I read five pages. So that part could be a little horrifying, but in terms of what's actually on the page, I, I, I do read more than that. And it's not make or break in that sense. Yeah. But when I start something, I do have a sense of, I, you know, I, I, I have a sense of how realistic, it, you know, um, it will be for me personally. I will yeah. say my husband, whenever I'm in a bookstore with him, he reads the first paragraph and then we'll decide if he's going to buy the book or not. And that horrifies me. So yeah. <laughs> as an editor, yeah. that horrifies me. Yeah. So uh, I yeah. do think readers can sometimes be tougher than editors. Oh yeah. I, I'm sure that's true. I, you know, this reminds me of um, the other book that I was going to write <laughs> and still may write at some point. I don't, uh, I don't know if you remember this uh, that well, but I ended up writing this book uh, in large part because you directed me toward writing this book. I had sent you some pages of something else that has been rattling around in my head for a long time. And it's the only thing of all the books I've written, it's the only thing that I haven't fully written. Like I, every time I start to write a book, I just write it and I finish that book. But this one thing is rattled around. I played with it, it rattles around. I play with it. And I sent it to you um, as, as a possibility for my next novel. And, um, and you were so good in your response in the sense that you said to me, if this is the book that you want to write, then this is the book that you should write. And then I said, well, you know, there is this other idea that I've had rattling around. The whiskey still. The whiskey <laughs> still. And I started telling you about that and you just lit up and you were yeah. like, okay, now that really captures my attention. However, you were so diplomatic. However, if the other one is, you know, if that's the book, you know, Sure. You didn't. You didn't want to squelch my my creative sense and my passion for for what I was doing, and I so appreciate that. Um, but look what I ended up getting. You know, I got this out of your excitement by saying this is a book that I would like to read, or you know, something in that direction. And I trusted that, having worked with you already on my other books. So that was really something that was that was very meaningful to me. I will always say having a per personal connection, if it's nonfiction, fiction, whatever, for a writer, I think that really comes across. And this isn't, this has a very, um, you know, the kernel was this thing in your own family, but yeah. you know, it, it took on a life of its own for sure. But you can say, this is how I came to the story, or this was rattling around in my brain because of my, my grandmother's story. I think having that connection, I don't know, I think it elevates a lot of work and it doesn't just have to be fiction. I think it makes it more fun to talk about. I think it feels alive and real and personal. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah. that's something that we kind of thrive on when we're talking about the books. When I'm pitching the books to my colleagues saying, and, and the writer has this personal connection. Wow. It's, the town is based on the town that she lives in. And okay. there's a character who owns a bookstore. Mm -hmm. all yeah. those <laughs> um, oh, you know, and, and yeah. this isn't your life. These aren't your, these are, it's fiction. These are made up characters. Right. It, there are shocking parallels to Agnes Martin's actual life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's fiction, but there's all these things that we can kind of talk about off the page that I think mm -hmm. um, is part of the publishing experience about how we think about, about we're selling this book, but we're also selling you as a writer um, yeah. and what you're bringing to the story. Yeah. And, and that's, help, that's helpful. For us. Yeah, I can see that. And it, and it really worked out. And I'm so grateful to you for that. Um, well, I see that we have some questions um, popping up. So I don't know if someone, is someone else facilitating that? Are you reading the questions or? I think uh, Vera no. is. Yeah, Vera's reading. Hi, Vera. <laughs> oh, oh, Vera, you're on Vera, mute. You're, you're muted. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's the first question that I see is from Jill Hansen. I think that dialogue can often make the difference between a good book and a great book. Do you agree? And is it hard to write? I love your dialogue in the books I have read. Well, thank you, Jill. Um, 
Yes, I agree 100% with that. Um, I can tell you from a reader and a writer perspective that um, when I am reading dialogue that someone else has written that doesn't ring true, the entire book ends up losing credibility for me because I cannot hear the conversation that these people are having. Instead, I feel the writer in there putting in the words. And so I'm immediately pulled out of the story and, and it might be hard to get me back. Is that how you feel, Nicole? Yeah, I think, I think if the dialogue isn't working, it can really take, take a good story down. You know, there's nothing worse than hokey dialogue. Yes. <laughs> um, and I yeah. think, you know, I, I always encourage writers to, to sort of read their dialogue out loud. And I yes. don't encourage them to read dialogue when they're at book reading, because I think it can sound hokey. Yes. Then. Although you, you, did, you did admirably with a little bit of dialogue <laughs> in your section. Thank you, you I know, was nervous. I know you I, because I Because I was like, mm, dialogue. <laughs> um, so it's a, little, it's a little pet peeve of mine. Because um, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's hard, it's, it's tricky. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it looks like there's a to... bunch of questions there. Yeah. Okay, um, so from Sharon Harrigan, can you talk about characters who appear in this book who appeared in another novel? Ah. Oh, I was going to ask you about that. I call yes. it the Deborah Reed cinematic universe, the novelistic <laughs> universe. The characters kind of pop up. <laughs> they do, and I, it's not, I don't even plan it. They just sort of end up, oh, well, they're on this street, and you know who else lives on that street? <laughs> you know? A character from another book. Um, and so I'll just have them wave from the window. Um, I don't know, you know, Elizabeth Strout does that. And I feel like, I, I don't know w what it is or, or why, but um, perhaps it's many things all, all at once. But um, uh, in Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan, the woman who owns the bookstore is Quincy, who is actually a child in Things We Set on Fire. And when you leave that end of that novel, um, you, things you said on fire, Quincy is just a very little girl and she's gone off to live with her father and her sister. And so that's how that story ends. And then I brought her back to be the bookstore owner in this book. And um, I only touched lightly on the fact that she, her mother died when she was young and she was raised by her father. And if you've never read any of the, you know, never read things you said on fire, it wouldn't really matter. But because I did that, for me, I revisited her again. And I was thinking about her as a woman. So now what has happened to her between the time she was the little girl and things you said on fire and the time she became this bookstore owner as a somewhat minor character in Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan. And now I've begun to work on a new book that is just about her. And then that time period of being a child and how she came to be the woman that she is. And she has sort of a mystical, um, strange quality to her as well. And I, I, um, I'm intrigued by her as a character. And so I'm, I'm exploring that. But yeah, there's, um, and Quincy's aunt, um, you know, is also in The Days When Birds Come Back at the very end, um, which I don't want to give that away, but she, there's just a little tiny bit in there that if you've read the other books, you'll recognize who she is. So, um, and, um, and then there's uh, the neighbors in, in uh, The Days When Birds Come Back also appear in Pale Morning Light with Violet Swan. Just briefly, if you've read the other ones, you'll recognize, but it almost feels um, like it makes me feel good to create something cohesive like that, where I know who all the people are. And um, I don't know, it's, I don't, I, I, it's like an Elizabeth Strout, Wendell Berry sort of <laughs> vibe, I guess. Cool. So here's a question from Carrie. Is this a good time to be pitching, um, whoops, it just moved, uh, pitching work to agents given the challenges of COVID? Mm. I assume that's for me. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, the business marches on. Uh, I, you know, we're trying to find our footing for books that are coming out in the world now. We pivoted to virtual events, as, as you have, and um, we're fighting up against a, a sort of endless news cycle. But we very much are, agents are pitching, editors are buying, you know, this, um, this is an old business 
publishing and we will continue to uh, to publish books and buy books. I will say, you know, I think people were probably fairly overworked before the pandemic. So being patient um, with people's time constraints and lives, I think everything is taking a little bit more time um, for sure. I know I'm taking longer to read things that agents are sending me. I'm sure they're probably taking longer with pitches that are coming in. So I just think everyone is, um, is a little stressed out and maybe needs a little bit of a little bit of patience on the other end, but I, you know, we're, we're working at the beat, the beat continues on. Um, <laughs> early on in the spring, I think it, Kathy mentioned in her introduction that I, I oversee the Best American series uh, and Best American Short Stories came out in 1915. Um, so we have a hundred plus year history of that. And I was working on Best American Short Stories in April when I was, you know, locked in my house. And it's kind of an old process. We often literally are like tearing pages out of journals to typeset. Um, and I had these like torn out pages and I thought if they could get this book out during World War One and World War Two and during the depression, I'll be <laughs> damned if I can't get this out in COVID. So there yeah. is this kind of this expansive, you know, we're, we're, we're part of history and we're going to continue to publish books. So yes, pitch agents, I think everyone's kind of working. I just think the bandwidths are, you know, a little tricky right now, but for sure, people are working. We're, you know, we're, we're going to go on. Good. Good to hear. So yes. um, here's a question from Lynn, I presume for Deborah. Are you writing another book? You kind of told us that already. Yeah, I am. Yeah, it's just what I mentioned. I'm just sort of starting the the inklings, the the hints and the the sense and the the nuance. I haven't heard. I haven't heard about Quincy and her mystical mm -hmm. past. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> so, intrigued. Yeah, Nicole doesn't really know this. No, just, I was like, um, this is the first I've heard of this, and she's not that old. How how much of a past can she have? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm used, to, um, I'm used to Violet, you know? Right. Yeah. A whole 93 years. Yeah. No. Um, yes. It, but it's, it's very, very new and I'm just beginning it, but it has that exact same feeling, that spark, that just something in there that I know that I want to pursue. So again, J. Edgar Hoover gets put to the side <laughs> ah, and, you know, I'm going to do, do this other thing. So thanks for asking, Lynn. <laughs> Okay, and here's a comment from Carol. Um, thanks for sharing the cover story. Glad you spoke up. <laughs> here's a question for Nicole from Kathy. Uh, we know you were working with Deborah from an idea of a novel because you had already been working with her on a former book. When you acquire a new novelist with a full manuscript, do you ever know from the beginning that many changes will be needed, but you love the kernel of the story? Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think you, I think I often would have thoughts about how I might change things or um, what work might need to be done. Rarely do I get a, do I get a novel on submission that I think is perfect and I wouldn't change anything because um, that's just how my brain works at this point. <laughs> um, but some of, you know, if it's a whole overhaul, where there's just a, a kernel, you know, I think that can be a real risk to, to do a contract and, and have an advance and then you don't always know how it's gonna turn out. So if it's a really um, extensive kind of rework, I think an editor might have a conversation often with a writer and an agent and say, you know, I, there's something here, but I don't feel comfortable right now. If you wanna do some reworking and come back, I would certainly look at it again, either exclusively or not. Um, editors often put work into things that they don't end up buying, whether that's in a big editorial letter because they're trying to get a book or on an author call where they're trying to woo an author and then maybe they lose an auction or, mm. you know, the house maybe didn't feel comfortable going forward, but the editor had invested time and thought into something. So that's just sort of how it goes. Um, you know, I think you can buy something that needs a little bit of work and maybe um, a writer might not be as amenable as you initially thought they would be. That can happen um, <laughs> because you can't, you can't always predict 
uh, how how much edit editing a person's going to take. Really, I mean, you know, I think the best case scenario is that you're up front with kind of what your final vision is. But sometimes, you know, um, more can come off in the cutting, you know, in the cutting and, you know, people can be precious about stuff. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's certainly always worth having a conversation. I feel like editors will always have a conversation if there's something they like, even if it's not quite there yet what comes out of that conversation, whether or not it's a contract or just a relationship where you're continuing to work, you know, the paths can diverge. Great, thanks. And another comment from Carol. Love that this extraordinary, complexly choreographed novel grew from the seed of the whiskey still. Love the book. The characters are still inhabiting my mind and spirit. Look forward to reading your other books. Thanks, good conversation today. So that I should mention that's Carol from um, KMUN Radio, <laughs> the arts program who interviewed me yesterday. We had a wonderful conversation, and uh, because she's you know she has a program on on the arts. Um, so thank you, Carol. That's that's very good to hear. I'm, I'm so glad you appreciate the book and the cover and and all. <laughs> Great. Here's a question from Dave Dillon: How does a contemporary author wall off herself? from the outside world in order to spend time creating a story in another time and space. Oh boy. Well, I would say as an author, it's getting increasingly difficult to be able to do that. Um, but at the same time, when you do do that, you, you feel the, um, the, you reap the benefits of diving back into your creative self, it's, it's, um, it renews you. And I highly recommend that people make an effort to turn off the news. Uh, in fact, I have this, this storyline in the book, the, the uh, Violet's Frank. son, Fra Frank. Frank, Frank, she, everyone else calls him Frank. She, his name is Francisco, but it's, that's the storyline. He's obsessed with um, the news and the bad news and the falling apart of the world. And um, what's, I will say a funny thing about that. That's while, why he's smoking. <laughs> that's why he's outside smoking. That's right. He, um, while we've been on this, um, this Zoom um, event, um, the jets that I write about in the book that Frank is obsessed with were at, literally flying over and I was wondering if you guys could hear the rumble of them. Um, but that is a, that is a, a, a point uh, uh, in here where Violet is, she wants him to turn off the news, stop looking at his phone and do something creative with his hands. And ultimately he, you know, that's what he's trying to find his way back to is the creation of, he builds things um, with wood. And um, I, I just think it's a life force, especially right now to turn to books. It's if, if, if you can't write one, at least read one. <laughs> um, I think it's truly the thing that's going to save us and, and so many of us and get us on the other side of all of this stress is to remember the pleasures of reading, to, to, absorb bigger ideas than ourselves, than what we are going through right now, and to lose ourselves in other stories and to gain the empathy that you gain um, and to have the hope for humanity. And all of those things are found in books, whether you're reading them or, and or writing them. So just do it, I guess, is <laughs> ultimately what I'm saying. Wonderful. Um, so Kimberly asks, Deborah, what piece of advice would you give an aspiring writer who has never written formally before? Ah, uh, um, I think, you know what I wish someone would have told me many, many years ago when I was trying hard to write? Um, I wish that someone would have told me, um, oh, I think, oh, I regret, Glass made a wonderful video of, of this and, and you should look this up on YouTube. Just look up Ira Glass and creativity and you will find the video. And what he's saying is exactly what I wish I would have known. And that is that you, your desire to become a writer, um, it does not, is not going to 
in, in the beginning, it's not going to meet, meet your skill set or your standard of what writing should look like. There's going to be a big gap between what you are able to do and what you recognize as good writing. And if someone had told me that that was normal, that what I was putting down on the page, that even though it was just terrible, that that wasn't the, that, that, that didn't, when I saw how bad my writing was in the beginning, because writing is hard, <laughs> newsflash, and it takes a lot of practice um, and study to get better. Um, if I had known that it was just a matter of getting, you know, closing that gap between my skill set and what my standard was for good writing, because if you want to be a writer, you generally have a, a standard, like you recognize what good writing is, you've been moved by good writing. And that's what you aspire to. Um, and so you, you know, there's that whole 10 year or 10,000 hour thing too that Malcolm Gladwell said, you know, whether you like him or not, um, there's something to that. It, it, it takes time and it takes practice and you have to allow yourself to write badly before you're going to understand how to write better. So give yourself a break. That's the best advice I would give to a young writer. Great. Thanks. Um, another question from Kathy for Nicole. How many books might you be working on at any one time? Mm. Oh my. Um, well, in terms of actively editing, right now, I, I don't know, actually, I've never, I've never like broken it down exactly, but uh, like right now, I'm, pro I'm actively kind of in an editing process on three books, I would say. Um, three novels, and no, two novels and nonfiction, one nonfiction. Two of them are on our fall 21 list. So coming out next fall. Um, the nonfiction is under contract, but isn't currently on a list, but I just got a, got a draft. But then I have books that are in various stages of production. So I have all of my spring 21, what year is this? Yes, all my spring 21 books are already onto the copy editing stage, but I'm still very much involved in getting those ready to, to be out in the world. But like the actual editing piece is done on my end. Um, so in terms of editing right now, I'm working on three things in terms of books that I'm actually working on it's probably closer to 10 maybe that I have sort of in various stages um, and that's probably kind of small because I um, I work on front list books but I also work on our back list um, so I'm involved in a lot of repackaging projects um, new editions of things um, making sure our classics look good and are continuing to be sold uh, so that's like a different piece of my job. So most of my colleagues who only sort of work on front list books, that those numbers would be higher. But I'm in a little bit of a hybrid where I work with, um, you know, books that have been out in the world for a while and we're continuing to, to sell. And what um, are those? And Do some you of just those throw the names are, out? Some the of those classics? are dead. Oh, yeah. well, uh, <laughs> that can be that can be like putting new covers on, on books like you just uh, did a big um, push for Virginia Woolf. We're the um, original publishers of Virginia Woolf in the U.S. So we just put new covers on those. Um, Mrs. Dalloway is entering the public domain next year. So um, we will no longer exclusively publish that, but we wanted to make sure that the rest of them looked pretty good. Uh, we just did um, a bunch of Jose Saramagos. We're always doing um, Calvinos. So authors where we have a lot of their backlist we're always trying to continue to, to promote um i'm working on a new cover for silent spring um and you know getting a new introduction for that we just have been doing some new stuff with you do our wealthies backlist um so there's there's stuff like that always kind of percolating as well uh, as well and the best americans which are annual and ongoing through mm -hmm. depression and wars and yeah. Viruses. So, <laughs> um, so my job's a little bit of a hybrid, um, but yeah, there's there's always a lot, there's always a lot going on, always a lot to read. That's great. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions, 
So I just wanted to let people know that we next month, um, you know, November is always our mystery month. And so on November 21st, we'll have another conversation with an author, Kendra Elliott, who writes um, mysteries. And so for those dark and stormy nights, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk to her and find out what she's up to. So if there's nothing else, maybe I'll maybe I'll come for that now that yeah. now that I'm just zooming in. Maybe I'm right. going to be a regular just, attendee. You know, it's so great to have people from all over. Mm -hmm. Great. So got a couple of comments. Uh, love the program, and I guess this might be the end. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone who signed up and um, joined us today. I can't see who you are, but I'm so glad you came. And thank you, Manzanita Writer Series. And thank you, Nicole, as always. Thank you. For being it's such a pleasure so awesome. for, for everyone. Yes. I'm, yes. I'm so pleased to be able to. I wouldn't have been able to do this in a normal time. So <laughs> yeah, so I know. It's the silver lining for sure. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye.